Uh, it also expresses the guide sequence that directs that nucleus to perform the, the cut. Um, and it can also, and does also express the uh, repair proteins, ancillary or supporting repair proteins. So once the guide is expressed along with the nuclease, uh, for all of you who now are quite familiar with CRISPR, you know that it binds to the, the genome as directed by the guide sequence, and then performs the cut with double-stranded brain, okay? So after that, uh, the other key piece to what we're providing, and really what I think of as sort of a stroke of genius, one of our, our co-founder, Andrew Garst, had the brilliant notion to be able to say, in addition to directing the nuclease with the guide sequence using our plasmid, you could also use it as the template for DNA repair. So that's what's being depicted here, is that this particular plasmid molecule carries that donor sequence which along with the repair proteins, which again are expressed by the plasmid, perform the actual paste, right? Uh, and then you have a new genome, okay? A brand new genome with a defined, precisely controlled head, all right? And hopefully it has some phenotype all right? And then the other piece that will become important later is this plasmid, if you retain it in your system, has the trackability uh, to be able to look at thousands, tens of thousands of these different molecules within a whole population. Okay? So that's the key to really understand how the data is going to Alright? So let's start walking through some examples. So um, I'm in the Applications Development Group in Script, and my colleagues and I were very interested in trying to uh, showcase how we can really push the limits of genome engineering. And uh, there's really countless applications out there, and you're really only limited by your imagination. But one we hit upon that we think most folks can understand and appreciate is to look at, at the bacterial, the genetic determinants of bacterial responses to osmotic stress. But really, it's you know pretty canonical stress application. It could be any any challenge that you're interested in. Let me walk you through what this workflow look like looks like to give you a sense of the the scale and the, the time scale in particular. So after the design and generate process, which hopefully you either visited our booth or saw uh, one of the earlier talks and went into great detail of how that process works, but it's really pretty automated and turnkey. After you're done uh, designing and, and generating and we manufacture the reagents to actually carry out the editing process, in about three to four weeks, the material that's needed to actually carry out what I showed on the earlier slide is then transformed into the cell and the editing process um, takes place. And really the editing process is only about one to three days depending on your organism. So then you are in possession of a large number of precisely engineered cells with hundreds, thousands, possibly tens of thousands of different genotypes in the population. Then you can take these into what I'll show you uh, in, in some examples is a selection scheme where you're letting these thousands or tens of thousands of different genotypes battle it out under some selective pressure that you're interested in. Um, you take that material after you run those, in this case we just ran them for a couple days for our salt selections, then you subject them to barcode sequencing um, that allows you to rapidly get basically frequency or count data and see which of your edits are enriched or depleted in the population. And then you take that into an analysis and learn step. And so that's usually typically very fast. It's, it's just standard NGS sequencing and possibly some count statistics. Uh, and then from that, it's really what is it you want to do with that information. So the knowledge you want to, you want to create could be days to months. It's really up to you and your research question. All right? So that was the workflow. And these were actually pretty much close to the time that it took to, to carry out the, the study that I'm going to share with you now. So this is the salt selection uh, story uh, described in terms of the library conditions and the experimental uh, protocol. So what we did is we said, okay, let's target all of E. coli and let's do knockouts because that's an obvious thing to do. Uh, and let's do knockouts two different ways at two different positions in every, every target. Um, and as powerful as that is, that's not enough. We wanted to be able to go after these sort of non-trivial edit, edit types. And again, that's where I want to stress that y-axis variety of edit types. This is something that we're really passionate about enabling for, for the world, really, which is to say, I want to make non-trivial edits. In this case, it's like a 61 base pair promoter insert in front of every gene in E. coli. And oh, by the way, let's not just do one promoter. Let's do a ladder of promoters because we just don't know biology. We don't know the rules. So let's let nature tell us what works and what doesn't. All right? 
So there's a classical promoter ladder that you can pull out from the iGEM database. We chose five that represented sort of a broad spectrum of, of uh, putative or predicted um, uh, promoter strengths, okay? So in total, we're looking at 25,000 edits, and we put them all together in these cultivations, and then we run them for a couple days under different salt concentrations, all right? So my colleagues ran these experiments up to, in this case, uh, 600 millimolar and then 2 molar uh, salt concentrations. And you can see there's sort of a gradient here in terms of the growth. And one of our lab scientists had the foresight to know that the, they had a frowny face that shows poor growth here. Uh, that was by accident, but in, 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 in practice, these actually didn't grow that well and had uh, variable uh, count statistics. So what I'm going to show you is the more moderate stress conditions uh, and the results that, that came from that. So all of this was done in three replicates, and so you have a lot of reproducibility and confidence about the, the inferences that you're making about what edits are, are doing well or being depleted in the system. So this is just one more sort of technology slide just to absolutely make certain we all understand how this is working. So in that bacterial cell, we have each of our plasmids that code for a specific edit, which includes the guide RNA to perform the cut or guide the cut, and then the donor sequence that provides the paste. So that's in every single bacterial cell, and the different colors represent different designs, all right? Those designs then, if the editing works, confer a genomic edit in the genome of, in this case, E. coli as depicted. And then all of this material is then uh, put together as a pool through NGS sequencing, okay? So here is a picture of the count data across all of the treatment conditions for the sodium chloride. So you're averaging over all of the different strengths. And so what you're seeing here is for the different promoter strengths from dark to light, I'm going to walk you through those, but first we're starting with the knockout. And the radial direction is a log two count. It's proportional to the log two count. So you get an idea of, yes, we're able to go after the whole genome, and there's some variation in the, the, the amplicon data. All right, so that's the knockout. And then if we overlay a low strength promoter, you can see, again, we're getting good representation across the whole genome. And then as I keep going out to higher and higher strength, you even see a little bit of moving out in the radial direction, which has its own interesting uh, possibilities associated with it. And then you go to the higher strength promoters, uh, and you get a nice sort of rainbow understanding of you know, the scale of being able to go after the whole genome and the, the amount of count data that we have. OK, so let's actually look at what that count data looks like. So this is, it's not meant to. Uh, uh, overwhelm you in terms of the numbers. I just want you to understand the degree, the, almost the, the, the large scale of data that you can generate with these kinds of uh, technologies now. And in particular, what's interesting is that for those who've spent a lot of time in RNA-seq or, or single cell transcriptomics, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that these aren't passive observations of, say, transcript level. Okay, you're not looking at a gene and a transcript level, as probably many of you have done over the years. Each of these are individual interventions into a genome, right? So each of these are an experimental data point for which you're going to derive causal inferences. This is a big difference from what you have maybe been thinking about for many years using existing reading data, all right? So what we have is, for each row, a gene and the edit associated with it, and then the uh, different replicates across the top, and within each replicate, the, the um, salt concentrations, all right? So a total of 12 samples times 25,000 rows, okay? Uh, in total, we're looking at 300,000 data points, all right? Uh, those 300,000 data points, you want to start going through and understanding what the system is telling you. So one thing you can do, which is pretty typical with high dimensional data, is to take a matrix like that and compress it into a lower dimensional representation. So something that's been around for decades and is a very easy way to visualize high dimensional data is something called principal component analysis. And in particular, what we're doing here is we're taking those 12 samples and we're saying, how do things cluster? Are the profiles across those 25,000 edits similar or different for the different replicates and the different salt concentrations? And what you see is kind of a nice pattern, which is for a given you know, uh, triplicate data, these all cluster together in the PCA projection as you go from no treatment up to higher salt concentrations, okay? So that's one way to start to visualize the data and see how reproducible things are. So now, I think we've all seen these, um, 
these videos where you start, you know, with an ant on a blade of grass in your backyard, and then it, it starts to zoom out to, you know, your neighborhood, to the city, to the, to the, to the earth, to the galaxy. And so I want to kind of walk you through that same sort of zoom out experiment, where we're starting with one gene, this WAAZ gene, with one particular edit, which is a medium strength promoter. And for that one gene, and this is sort of if you were to do one gene with one titration, this would be a, a typical result. And in this case, what we're looking at here is as the sodium concentration increases, you're getting enrichment with that particular edit. So the inference is, is that these guys have a higher count number uh, relative to the control uh, uh, condition as you move up to higher concentrations, all right? So this slope is the biological response, and we'll use that a lot throughout the rest of the presentation. That number, or a standardized version of it, is the number that we'll use to try to understand whether something is being enriched or depleted in the population, okay? So it turns out that one particular protein, if you start trying to make sense of what's going on in your system, has to do, uh, it's a lipopolysaccharide core biosynthesis protein that's involved in maintaining the the, the integrity of the, the cell membrane under stress conditions. So it kind of stands to reason that you might see a response like this, all right? So that's one gene with one edit. So let's stick with this one gene, WAAZ, and just orient you to what we looked at on the last slide and the slope that we saw, and then look at the other promoter edits from low strength to high strength, and you also get this similar trend. And it looks like, in general, a constitutive promoter in front of this gene is driving uh, resistance uh, or tolerance to the salt stress with possibly a little bit of a Goldilocks phenomenon where this is, this is the most benefit. So maybe promoter tuning is necessary to get the most out of this particular edit. And then on the other side of the coin, you have the stop where you're doing a loss of function mutation on that particular gene. And the two different stops pretty much give you the exact same response in the system which is at higher sodium concentration, you're creating a susceptibility to that stress, okay? So now zooming out even further to the galaxy, uh, we're looking at now that same gene plotted on each of the different edit types, the promoters and the triple stops, and within each panel, we're looking at 4,000 genes, right? All the genes in E. coli. So that slope or standardized slope statistic that I mentioned on the prior slides is plotted on the y-axis, and here you see that high slope here, but all of these were giving some benefit, and again, the knockouts are deleterious for the, with the trip uh, with, on that particular gene, and you can kind of get a sense for the broad amount of information that's available now at your, your disposal. So positive direction is enriched, negative direction is depleted, all right? So now you can start to look at all kinds of interesting questions now that you have the full galaxy of data, as it were, and you can start to imagine another matrix, right, which in one dimension is thousands of genes, and in another dimension is the edit type, prom different promoters and, and uh, two different forms of stops. So you take that matrix, and you can start to do some dimensional reduction and clustering and, and, and examine what, the, what patterns are in your data. So this is a really interesting, uh, maybe not surprising, but nice confirmatory result that shows that if you look now at a PCA uh, representation for the seven edit types now, so that dimension, and you project where the different edit types fall, what you see is in the first principal component, which generally captures most of the variation, the knockouts tend to be on one end of the cube and the promoter edits are on another. So that, that sort of pattern reliably holds up that knockouts do things different than promoters. Probably not surprising, but definitely shows that we're driving biology in different ways with the different edit types. And then if you remove the knockouts from the analysis and just look at how the promoters are distributed relative to each other, you get this interesting structure that the first principal component completely separates the low strength promoters from the high strength promoters. And within the high strength promoter from the second highest to the highest, you get uh, a lot of separation and variation. And in the low strength promoters, you get this nice gradient. So you, we've done this now with lots of different experiments, and we consistently see this kind of separation that sort of corresponds to the promoter strengths that we know are going into the system. OK. So that was that big matrix that you have in your mind that has seven columns and 3,000 rows. Let's look at it projected this way. And there's all kinds of nice tools that allow you to cluster things um, in ways that allow allow you to look for patterns and relationships. So now what we're going to do is we're going to use a different projection te technique called UMAP clustering. It's similar to T-SNE clustering if you're 
familiar with that. But now we're going to work on the 2800 genes, and we're going to ask how do these things cluster together in their profiles across the edit type. So what you're looking at here is thousands of genes in our system, and we're trying to understand how things cluster. So for example, if we look at this cluster over here, and we look at how the edit types are distributed in terms of either enrichment or depletion patterns, this particular cluster looks like no matter what you do, whether it's a knockout, a weak promoter, a strong promoter, or anything in between, you tend to hurt its survivability under the higher salt concentrations. And if you start doing a gene ontology enrichment analysis, you pull out some things that make sense. So this is involved in DNA replication is the, is the most significant one. It's probably not surprising. I mean, E. coli has been around for I don't know how many hundreds of millions of years. It's developed and refined itself to survive as best as it can in the environment, these are probably core processes that you don't want to touch to get better performance. On the other side of the clustering map are these genes that when you dig into them have an interesting pattern in that when you put a promoter on front of them, they confer a survival benefit uh, on average to uh, the higher salt concentrations, whereas the knockout tends to get depleted in the population. So gain of function is a benefit, loss of function uh, things get depleted out, all right? And then if you look at gene ontology processes that are enriched in that cluster, you get some things that make sense as well, which is, again, things involved with the, the membrane to, that uh, confer tolerance uh, under stress conditions. And then two more clusters really quick just to sort of complete the story. These are sort of the mirror images of those, whereas the knockout conferred a benefit, the loss of function, the things that were depleted were promoter inserts. Um, and then the last cluster here is uniform enrichment, where almost anything you do tends to help. And uh, there's actually some interesting uh, go stories behind each of these, but in the interest of time, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Okay? But that sort of hopefully gives you an idea of the kind of uh, degree, scale of data, and the kinds of analysis you can start to do with, with, with these results. So you want to start thinking about how to leverage the, the, this technology and the data that's being generated. So one thing that is, uh, we're thinking is going to be uh, pretty typical is to do these large-scale experiments. And if you have some prior beliefs and you want to confirm or corroborate or recapitulate known biology or literature reports, um, this affords you the opportunity to do that. And then once you have that confidence, you can sort of move out and discover new things and extend it to, to new areas of biology. So what we're looking at here is a gene ontology category that was enriched, and it had to do with osmotic stress, right? So you look for that, and you found enrichment in about a dozen genes, uh, enriched for the, for the GO process. And within each of these genes, they were either depleted or they were enriched in the process. So don't have time to go through all of these. They all have a story behind them. But let me just walk through three of them just to give you an idea of what's going on here. So E. coli, so I'm not an... Uh, osmo light uh, expert or salt stress expert, um, but uh, you can easily go out and you know curate the, the the whatever genes you find and edits you find that are important and start to map it onto to known uh, cell function. And so the the osmolite biosynthesis and turnover is a core part of protecting the cell against these higher salt stress conditions. And in particular. Uh, this gene is responsible for turning over and creating more of this osmoprotectant. And GSHA is a particular gene that when you knock it out has been reported in the literature to create susceptibility to high salt stress. And this is something that we just pulled out from the large scale experiment and pretty conclusively showed and, re and corroborated the existing literature reports out there that show that at high salt concentrations when you knock this guy out you get a big depletion in the in the, the, the counts for that particular edit. Another knockout uh, that uh, tended to hurt under high salt concentration was the transport of these osmoprotectants, glycine and, and betaine. And what we, oh, the graphic got messed up. <laughs> Sorry about that. But what, what you should have seen here is the depletion over higher concentrations for that particular um, knockout. This is really unfortunate that the slides got <laughs> messed up. But what I'll tell you here is that this promoter insert uh, gave you a increase in performance as uh, we went to a, a medium strength promoter, okay? Okay, so 
that's sort of trying to understand biology and giving you confidence that the experiment was well run and, and corroborated with the existing literature. And then you want to start to go out and, and leverage these results for whatever application you're interested in. So irrespective of whether you are trying to understand the biology or whether you're just trying to optimize for something, you can use this data. And in particular, if you're just doing forward engineering where you might not even care about why it's working, but it just works, um, this is an example of a pretty straightforward uh, forward engineering application where if you were to take, say, the top 180 or so gene hits that were in your uh, selection scheme and you were to plot them on the E. coli genome, you can get a sense for the distribution of the promoter strengths um, where they lie and, and a number of knockouts that conferred uh, some enrichment. And you don't have to know necessarily why these work. It's very well developed, especially in the field of protein engineering and classical mutagenesis of, of strain engineering, is that these diversity can then go into a forward engineering campaign where you start by generating diversity and then you recombine it over many rounds in order, or as many rounds as you need to get higher performance. Okay. So this could be generalized to pretty much any you know, stress that you want to put on the system. Could be temperature, could be adaptation to process conditions, maybe uh, biological challenges. It's whatever you want, right? Uh, hopefully the salt application was just enough to get you, you know, your imagination going about for your own application what, what you want to select for. Okay. So the next application I want to talk about is, is really completely different, but it looks the same way in terms of the diversity we generated and the, 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 the selection scheme. And this was done in, in collaboration with uh, eminent researchers at MIT, uh, Jim Collins, uh, who's a uh, well-known researcher in synthetic biology and is also very passionate about uh, antibiotic discovery, and his colleague John Stokes. And what they were very interested in was interrogating the genetic determinants of antibiotic function, both susceptibility and tolerance. And when we started talking with them, we said, hey, you know, we can go after pretty much any set of targets you want in the genome. And in particular, they were interested in a set of about 600 genes that were picked out to be um, thought to be important or implicated in, in a, a function of interest for antibiotic resistance or, or susceptibility. And some 238 were essential under one curation, all right? Uh, the, not, the edit types look pretty much like what we had before, where we had the promoter ladder, and then we had the, at least one knockout. And in total now we're looking at about 3,000 designs. And the promoter ladder is the same one that we had for the SALT studies. Okay? But the selection scheme and the experimental setup, the speed with which we were able to generate these libraries and deliver them to our colleagues so that they could test them under increasing antibiotic concentrations with two different uh, classes of antibiotics, and two replicates. Again, we took the material out, did NGS sequencing, and ran through the same sort of count statistics that we saw before. All right? So what does this look like? So I showed you the E. coli genome before for the salt conditions and where the edits were. It's a similar kind of plot, but it's not as filled in because we only went after 600 targets. Again, the radial direction is the log two count, but you can get a sense for where we went after the, the targets in the genome and they're colored by whether they're essential or non-essential. Um, so that's the distribution on the genome. And then this distribution over here kind of shows you what it looks like on a density plot. Um, and so you can kind of get a sense for what the counts were that we got in this system. So between dozens and hundreds of counts, sometimes a thousand or so. Um, and then this little peak over here has an interesting story behind it. The, the teaser is it has to do with essentiality and we'll get to that story in just a minute. Okay. So what does this count data look like? Um, so if we look at gentamicin concentration and we look at the replicates for the control or the low stress uh, concentration for this particular antibiotic, what you're seeing here is the count data across the two replicates in, in each and every pairwise sample comparison. So what you're seeing is a very high reproducibility across the two different replicates uh, for both the control and for the low stress a challenge. And you can't really see by eye here, but there is starting to be some differences between the treatment and the control. Where things really start to look different is when you compare the treatment and the control and you start to see large variations in the count data. And this is exciting. This is not noise. And you know it's not noise because within the replicates it's really tight. 
So there's real biology that's being driven here by the combination of adding stress with your edits, okay? So this data set, when you multiply it out and look at all of the data points that are in it, uh, you're looking at 40,000 data points, all right? And what we're doing here is, again, a PCA sample, but we're projecting for the 14 samples where they lay. And this is a nice way to visualize from no treatment, antibiotic treatment, to low treatment, to medium treatment, to high treatment. You're starting to get separation for the two reps in each, each antibiotic class, um, and they cluster together well across the two reps. Okay, um, and interestingly, gentamicin sort of you know goes its own way in the projection, and ciprofloxacin goes uh, goes in a, in a somewhat different direction. And yet, there's also some common signal. So we'll look at that uh, here in just a second. Um, so again, starting with a single gene to sort of give you confidence and understanding of how this data is being generated. Th again, the s the slope is the biological response that you're interested in here. So with increasing uh, antibiotic concentration. You're looking at what edits are either enriched in the population or depleted. So in this particular gene, the YAGH gene that we actually kind of pulled out just because it had an interesting uh, pattern of data. I had no prior knowledge of this gene. I'm also not an antibiotic expert. Um, when we looked at the actual annotation around YAGH, uh, apparently it's involved in, in stress response. And in particular, it, it looks, it's interesting. It's, it's a, it's a prophage gene that uh, was uh, coming from some horizontal gene transfer that in E. coli, when you knock it out, actually creates susceptibility to certain antibiotics. And we basically just reconfirmed that at least for this antibiotic, you get that same kind of loss of function or susceptibility. Whereas when you add a promoter to it, you get an increase in the, the tolerance, okay? So, I mentioned a few slides ago uh, some interesting phenomena associated with essentiality, and so I want to walk you through that here just briefly. So you think about what our technology is doing now. Uh, we're able to go after the whole genome with lots of different edit types, and a, a simple one is a knockout. And what we're looking at here is for the almost 600 targets, we're interested in the untreated condition, what's our count data associated with that particular edit, editing cassette. And what you see is for the non-essential genes, you get a nice distribution of normalized count data. But not surprisingly, when you try to knock out an essential gene, you are largely depleted in your count data, right? So this, we can't control biology, and, and we want biology to tell us what works and what doesn't. This is pretty good evidence that our editing is working well, and that that's probably a good list of essential genes, okay? And this, is what our collaborators were most excited about. Knockouts, you know, you could go to the KO collection um, and, and get some mileage out of that, but this capability is, the, is what our collaborators were most in interested in. And, and they really wanted to be able to interrogate essential genes in ways that have heretofore been impossible. And so what we're seeing here is that the normalized count data for whether it's a non-essential or an essential gene looks largely similar. There's a little bit of loss here, which is probably not surprising given it's an essential gene, but we're able to now make edits around uh, and in front of these essential genes and study their behavior in the, in the antibiotic system. All right? So let's start to look at um, what that data looks like. So apologies, things got cut off here, but the ones that are colored are the significant edits and the ones that are in gray in the background are not significant. So after you run through a statistical analysis, again, we're looking at that biological response. So things that are positive are enriched, things that are negative are depleted. So under high, con under concent high concentrations of gentamicin or ciprofloxacin, you get a quadrant where things are generally enriched, okay, together. Uh, uh, they have a sort of a similar pattern. And then on the other side of the coin, you have things that when you make that edit, they're susceptible to both antibiotics, okay? Um, and then there's these cross categories where for these particular sets of genes and edits, they have a distinct pattern in that, for example, this is uh, resistant to gentamicin but susceptible to ciprofloxacin. So this is a boon to antibiotic researchers because it allows them to start to tease out what are the common and different patterns in antibiotic resistance um, and susceptibility. And so if you do a gene ontology enrichment analysis like we've kind of done before, 
you pull out similar patterns that you'd expect. So if either response to drug or antibiotic, you have an enrichment uh, for those categories within these, these genes, okay? Then if you start looking at individual genes, you can start to see if things make sense. So for example, this NUSB gene, when you put a promoter in front of it, we found that it was enriched in the population for both gentamicin and ciprofloxacin. And you can kind of do the same kind of study where you go out and look and see is this confirm or, or, or uh, reject you know, prior work. And the KO collection, which I mentioned earlier, has been done and used for years. And antibiotic selections have been tried against it. And interestingly enough, you go and look this up. When you knock it out in the KO collection, it makes it really susceptible to a wide class of antibiotics. We're looking at kind of the opposite side of that story, which is when you put a promoter on it, you get resistance to at least these two antibiotics. So again, somewhat confirming like we're uh, recapitulating known biology, but more importantly, once you have that confidence, you can now start to extend to things, new areas of biology, all right? So then in the final case study that I wanna mention as we wrap up here, uh, you probably, if you went to any other talks, you might have already seen this example, but it's, it's a really nice classic metabolic engineering example, which for me as a forward engineer sort of um, gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, and it is an example of trying to edit the uh, lysine pathway and genome to produce more lysine, which is a multi-billion dollar molecule. We're not a lysine shop, but we want to inspire people to do similar work for their own pathways and genomes. And it's like any other you know, uh, uh, situation where you can either work at the protein, the pathway, or genome level. So DAP-A is a well-known protein that controls flux in, uh, towards lysine. You can target that, or you can go after each of the individual enzymes, or you can go after the whole genome. And we wanted to be able to sort of push the limits and go after everything. So what we really did is we did essentially the equivalent of full saturation mutagenesis across all 19 enzymes in the lysine pathway, and then also did genome-wide knockouts, and again, that promoter ladder that we've been using a lot of. So in total, we had 200,000 edits um, that represented you know, a huge source of diversity for forward engineering. So let's look at what that data looks like. So all of these edits now are in your population. What we have found over and over again in engineering biological systems is it's not necessary to see everything. A shallow sampling can generate and recruit a lot of beneficial diversity. And so what we're looking at here is sampling just about 10% of the library using you know, great uh, technology from folks like Agilent. This is a rapid fire mass spec that gives us a readout on lysine every seven seconds. And even with that capability, we looked at about 10% of the library and we're seeing for the different library types whether they're the knockouts on the left, the saturation mutagenesis on the lysine pathway, or the promoter edits on the right, we're getting some candidates that are improved in terms of the lysine titer on the y-axis. Okay, so numerous hits were found in primary screening, and just like any other screening campaign, you go into uh, a retest. And so what we're looking at here is under two different um, media conditions, we're getting very large fold improvements uh, dozens to hundreds to even a thousand fold improvement for some of the edits. And we're getting all kinds of different edit types. We're getting amino acid mutations in the circles and then the other symbols represent promoters or stops. So there's just a lot of diversity out there that's just waiting to be had now that you can access these kinds of edit spaces. And in particular, uh, we're finding a lot of diversity that sort of defies explanation. And this certainly wouldn't show up high in the list of things you'd pick from a rational standpoint. Uh, and it reminds us a lot of what we've seen in proteins over the years and, and what you heard from Frances Arnold in her keynote yesterday is there's just so much we don't know about biology for the foreseeable future you're going to have to let nature tell you what works and what doesn't. So a number of enzymes were validated in the lysine pathway to be important um, and then the next step is to try to move out to the full genome uh, and really develop a system that allows us to see even more of the edits and so I want to walk you through a selection scheme that was basically geared towards trying to get the bug to produce more lysine by challenging it with a toxic inhibitor. And the goal is to try to get it to overproduce lysine in the presence of this toxic analog. And you can see what my colleagues back in Inscripta did is they said, okay, let's add this toxic inhibitor or have the control condition and let these thousands, tens of thousands, even 100,000 edits battle it out 
and find out who's surviving in that population. And even though the growth is somewhat stunted, there are definitely survivors in here. So let's try to pull out those survivors using the NGS barcode technology that I've talked about before in the other case studies and look at all that count data. And this data set represents 500,000 data points that we're able to pull out and start to map for which edits are enriched uh, in the population. And so if we start with just the pathway, there are 170,000 edits in, those, in the pathway. What we're just looking at here is every single enzyme in the lysine pathway had at least one mutation, many had dozens, even hundreds, that conferred a benefit under this selective condition. And in the radial direction, you're looking at that kind of enrichment score. DAP-A being an important protein definitely came out uh, in the selection along with others. And then within the genome-wide libraries, the genome-wide knockout shows a number of, that were also conferring uh, resistance or survival under that, that toxic situation. Lyse-P is an interesting transporter of lysine. It's also involved in regulation. Uh, and it's actually a little bit of a mystery as to how it works, but it was picked up in the screen as well. And then finally, the genome-wide promoter library had all kinds of edits all throughout the genome that were showing a very significant enrichment in the data. So in total now, we have 100 new targets outside of the lysine pathway that we can use in a forward engineering campaign, okay? So really quickly in wrapping up, going back to the uh, screening that we were talking about, is if you look at what we did in round one, we're just rank ordering from the smallest hit up to the largest hit. And on this linear scale, it's a little hard to see, so we're showing you the fold improvement. And I've already talked about pretty much all these edits. The Lice-P edit gives you a 210-fold improvement when you knock it out. This uh, amino acid change, which has been implicated in allosteric feedback regulation of the DAP-A protein, gave us a 460-fold improvement. And then if you stick a strong promoter in front of it, you get almost a 1,000-fold improvement. So this represents a great start for forward engineering. If you take this as the backbone, that amino acid mutant, and you screen a library, a genome-wide library of promoters and knockouts, you get fold improvements that give you anything better than you saw in the first round. And then the combination of the expression change on DAP-A and the amino acid change gives you this nice killer combination of getting something almost 10,000 or over 10,000 fold improved for lysine titer. Um, and then keep going, right? This is what we do in forward engineering. Let's take that double mutant and screen another library that was down-selected from these hits, right? And from those hits now, you stack these on top of here in a, in a library, and you're finding things that are even better. And in fact, one of our best things is a really nice example of all three edit types, right? We have an amino acid change, a promoter change, and a knockout, right? And together gave us 14,000-fold improvement. And importantly, we did this in about four months with very little work on the, the, what you might think of as the molecular biology side of things, the strain build. Because this technology allows you to rapidly build these large libraries, honestly, most of the time was spent on the screening side. Okay? So the Onyx platform. So hopefully you've had a chance to see a fair bit of it uh, during the course of the conference. Um, let's just sort of finish with it just to remind uh, you what we're trying to now give you, the rest of the community, or, or the community at large, a, a, a powerful capability. So it really is load, set parameters, and push button, okay? Um, it results in an output of edited cells, precision edited cells, and has a number of different important uh, criteria that went into engineering the system, all right? So where are we now? So genome scale phenotype, genotype to phenotype mapping is now possible. And I, I really can't stress this enough, is that if you think about genome biology, it's been largely an observational science. It's been very amazing, incredible discoveries, but really for the first time now, we're able to do causal or experimental studies where we're intervening and making thousands of edits and trying to understand the causal relationships in your system as opposed to just correlation. And we feel really strongly about giving you, the community, a platform that allows you to you know, focus your energy and resources on your questions and goals. And so now, the challenge is for you, right? Now that you remove the constraints of your imagination based on what was possible before today, what can you do with the full potential of the genome at your, your disposal? Okay? So thank you very much.